Good evening. Welcome to St. Andrews College Summer Dialogues and Discussions. I believe this is number five. Someone can correct me uh, if I've missed that. We started in late May. Uh, we're now heading into the home stretch of June. Uh, the topic tonight is Anglicanism and education. Um, I'd like to start with a bit of an intro and then get some feedback. Uh, first of all, the Anglican Church is the Church of the Fathers. The Anglican ethos is not to depart from the old ways, it is to hold them as a foundation for all time. And this is exactly the ethos needed for a sound education. To be educated, to be formed, to be trained um, is not just a mental thing, it's not just an intellectual thing, it's a whole person thing, if you will. To be educated is to understand reality, both about God and about the created world, and specifically about mankind within that created world. As fallen creatures, we cannot directly intuit all this knowledge. We must be formed, discipled, led, trained, taught, educated. Particularly at this time in history, this education can't really happen in one lifetime. In other words, it's important not to lose the learning of the past. Learning about ourselves is one of the reasons why we want to learn about the past. We're products of our history. Uh, we go back to our past to see where we came from, to see how uh, we are today based upon where we've been. And Dr. Seal uh, gave a letter discussion and a lecture on history and identity. And this is true in terms of education in general. It's true in terms of our formation and our academic life. We also, though, when we realize that we can't learn everything there is to learn, we can't even read everything there is to read. I mean, look at the internet, it's frightening. We want to learn about our world as broadly as we can. And no individual, no generation just can discover all that has been learned until now. Without the knowledge of generations, we are each of us alone in the wild with no resources. We think about some of the great minds in the history of the church, and even they did not get it all down. They didn't know every area to be known. They didn't know even all of theology. So, I've looked at the past as we're talking about the church and about how that influences education. I don't want you to think that this is an argument for living in the past. I think probably most people here wouldn't. But let's use an image. The foundation of the house is not the whole house but it's an important beginning, isn't it? The strength of Anglicanism is being formed by and grounded in the past in order to be healthy in the present and to build confidently for future generations without undermining the foundations. Now we could go off on a long tangent, which we will avoid, just looking exactly at how this has happened in the 20th century in many traditions, but particularly within the Anglican fold. The foundation has to be solid. And for an education, the foundation has to be solid. So we must look to the past so that we may go forward. That's how we know who we are. That's how we know what we're a part of. That's how we know what the church is and what the church has done. In a shorthand, um, I would recommend, first of all, um, read our website. There's some information on there, particularly on Anglicanism. It's about as brief as possibly could be, um, and it avoids much discussion, but it gives a basic overview of Anglicanism. 
No, Anglicanism, yeah, I bet you've never heard this, those, those of you that have grown up Anglican. Oh, right, you're the church that started because King Henry got, wanted to get rid of his wife and get a new one. Um, no, that's not the Church of England. Uh, here's a funny one. I was in the coffee shop, and I know a number of Roman Catholic laymen in town, good people, and they said, oh, hey, Father Foose, hey, we had Sunday school at church. I said, oh, wow. Well, what'd you learn? Welcome, Mr. Cunningham. Um, what'd you learn in Sunday school, guys? And they said, oh, well, we were studying church history, and I thought, oh, well, that's a good topic. And we found out that King Henry stole all of the Roman Catholic churches from Rome and turned them into his own church. Uh, I think that we don't have to go too far down the road to laugh at that. Um, the, um, the reality is that the church arrived in England very early on, probably the first century. Um, there is actually quite a bit of circumstantial evidence that um, makes the legend of Joseph of Arimathea uh, really uh, interesting. Um, some other time, you guys can uh, give me a call and I'll give you some more info. But first century, pretty easily. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You get mention of the church in England early, early on. We have excavations. I have stood in the apse of a chapel that was uh, built in a Roman fort. And the fort, Vindolanda, uh, was there before Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall came in circa 140. So this fort had existed before that. So that pushes Christianity into England probably at least by the turn of the uh, uh, second century. Um, the, the evidence for early English um, churchmanship is, is large. We also, most of us know that the church in England grew up rather separated from uh, the continental church. There's that big body of water that's rather hard to get across. Um, we also know that when uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury um, starts to move beyond Kent and he encounters the Celtic church, um, that there ends up being the Synod of Whitby in 664 to discuss, well, what's, you know, wh what tradition are we going to follow? Because the Celtic church tradition in the British Isles was very different from uh, the continental tradition. So we know that there is a church there that grew up a rather independently. Um, 664, they decide to follow the Roman rule for the dating of Easter and a lot of Roman traditions. Uh, the Celtic church, many of them did not give their traditions up so easily, but within a couple hundred, 300 years, there was uh, more things in line. But I've been to one of the oldest churches I know of in Britain, uh, dates, uh, I, I believe, many will say it's an Anglo-Saxon church. I think it's a Celtic church because it's built completely on St. Patrick's architectural lines. It's three times higher than it is wide. Uh, it's basically a box with a smaller box on the end. You can see in the back where the uh, timber frame apartment was built onto the back of the church. And up until the time of William the Conqueror, there were Celtic monastics, priests living with their families, two of them usually in that church, in that apartment to serve that church. So really the demarcation of the change in um, the Anglican world, uh, you know, the church in the British Isles was the 1066 William the Conqueror invasion. And of course, um, we know that all but one, I think it's Wolfston, someone correct me if that's wrong, I think Bishop Wolfston remains an Anglo-Saxon bishop. Every other bishop is gotten rid of and French bishops are brought in. So the influence of the continent at that time is huge. And the church in England starts to become um, very much influenced, maybe even um, stepped on at times uh, by the Pope in Rome. Of course, in the uh, Reformation, it was not a reformation like 
Geneva. It was not a reformation, even like Germany. Uh, it was not a reformation like the Huguenots or the or the uh, 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 Holland, but it is definitely a major event in the life of the English church. The unique thing is that they don't give up bishops, priests, and deacons. They don't give up the liturgy. They reform the church. And uh, one could make an argument that they are perhaps the most successful reformation in Europe during the 16th century. Um, many would argue against that, but I think you could at least make the argument. The status today, obviously, of the Anglican Church is rather broken and disjointed, like most churches that went through um, the 20th century and modernity. Uh, but there is also a lot of uh, life coming out, a lot of new life starting. So St. Andrew's College is, of course, coming out of a very traditional place. It is Orthodox. It is also Catholic. It's traditional. It's uh, a much more conservative, theologically speaking, picture of Anglicanism than uh, many would find if they just Googled Anglicanism in America. Uh, you might hit the right buttons, you might hit the wrong buttons. It's just a, it's, it's a mishmash of chaos out there. Um, so questions, comments, snide remarks? Mr. Turney, I leave that to you. Have you ever thought, those of you that have been Anglican uh, most of your life, you young people, have you ever thought, why isn't there an Anglican college that I could go to? Has that, has that question ever raised? I mean, we have, you know, all sorts of different denominational colleges out there. Uh, there have been, I want to say, eight to ten uh, Anglican colleges in America. I, I did this research a while back. And I didn't write it all down, so forgive me, I, I might be off by a bit. Um, but kind of bona fide, real schools that are controlled by a parish or a diocese. The only one that I'm aware of that we have in America right now is an Episcopal school, Sewanee, um, University of the South. And uh, I believe there are 10 dioceses across the South that uh, make up the governance of that school. So there is one here. It's just nothing I would ever send one of my graduates to. Um, the education has just become as disastrous as most out there and expensive. Um, so I have wondered for a long time, why don't we have Anglican colleges, conservative ones even, orthodox ones? We do have a number of conservative orthodox Anglican seminaries, but uh, as I've been saying, St. Andrew's College is the first Anglican college in well over 100 years. In fact, I think really it's about 150 years since we've had a new Anglican college show up on the scene. You can Google Anglican colleges historically, and you'll see many of them showed up and then disappeared, and uh, sometimes after a long run, sometimes not after such a long run. I'm going to address this topic in a hmm, five minute address, um, if you'll allow me. And I, I'm, I'm going to hit upon a lot of the points that I've been thinking about. Uh, I've got three audiences with this uh, dialogue, I've got and with this talk, I've got uh, a number of you I know grew up in the Anglican world, uh, traditional Anglicans. I've got a number of people that if they're not here tonight, will probably watch this who are evangelical and are curious. They've encountered Anglicanism, they've heard about it, or they've been to a service, or they're actively starting to attend somewhere. And that's a completely different audience, I think most of you will agree. The third audience is those that come from an ACNA background, Anglican Church in North America. And many of them have a picture, but it might not be a complete picture. Many Anglican churches in the ACNA are um, liturgy light. There's, there's, it's not obvious that there's a prayer book that's being followed, uh, even though most of the time there is. Um, so I'm trying to, trying to touch a number of things. Maybe your questions can help me uh, narrow it in a little bit uh, for different groups. C.S. Lewis once wrote, 
Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. With that quote, I have mused on this idea of Lewis's quote being applied to education. And when I say education, I do not mean facts and figures only. Of course, that's part of it. I do not mean just grammar or even logic and dialectic. I mean something which includes all of those things and more. I mean Holy Spirit-led transformation of the student. I mean what we used to call spiritual formation, and that's what we are attempting at St. Andrew's College. The Christian education in our culture, I'm afraid, is a bit of a picture of Lewis's quote, sometimes quite literally. Firstly, our desires are too weak. We don't really want the education that God wants for us and that the church down through the centuries has provided. That education is too difficult, too strenuous, too much time and effort. Secondly, we are half-hearted about our education, our learning of God's world and his purpose in redeeming and recreating it for beauty and for honor, which done rightly gives all the glory to him. Thirdly, we in the church are so caught up by the world that we really are fooling about with drink and sex and ambition literally. The stats of the culture war are pretty grim. The church is not just generally, is not just generally losing the war or has already lost it, according to Rod Dreher. But the casualties of the war are over and over again, churchmen. For example, look at the rampant divorce in the church. Look at the active sexual promiscuity amongst Christians. It's hard to see the Christian faith making a difference in these social, cultural, and personal issues when you look at the stats. Yet the secular progressives don't make any claims to regard chastity as special, so big deal for them, nor do they claim marital, marital commitment to promises as desperately important. But the church does, Jesus does, and yet we're walking with those that don't know Jesus. They don't have these issues. They, they're not worried about it. And we're walking with them as if we aren't either. In the education of our college-aged students, we have been happily making mud pies in the slum and teaching our college students how to do the same. We have missed the joy that Christ offers us in true education, in transformative education by the Holy Spirit. And this is an education that is caught as much as it is taught. It is an education that is absorbed as much as learned. This is an education that is about discipleship and spiritual formation as much or more than it is about academics. And the thing about our educations is that wherever we go, this will be true. We will, caught, we will catch, rather, a lot of our education will be formed by the people, the context, just the premises that are alive and well in the classroom will teach, shape, and mold us. Don't think for a moment that there is a neutral space when we're talking about training, education, formation. So we want to give a formation an education that is caught as much as taught, absorbed as much as learned, discipleship, spiritual formation. This is what we want to do. This is what we seek to do at St. Andrew's College. And this is what we've been doing with our high school students for over two decades. And when I say by his grace, we've done that by God's grace, you have to understand that St. Andrew's is, as Dr. John Seal would say, it's a God thing. Dr. Seale, I don't know if you remember saying that almost 20 years ago when you first came out here to St. Andrews, but it's been true over and over again as we walked these years and this road of being an educative institution that is 
holistic and, and, and concerned about the holistic part of it. There really is no human reason for St. Andrew's Academy or college to exist, but God has done amazing things this last year out of the ashes of the Dixie Fire here in our area. And we're right at the heart of it if you look at a map. He has been keeping us upright in many ways, financially, spiritually, emotionally, and just in giving us literal strength. We've been exhausted this last year. And in the midst of that, he has started a micro college out of those ashes as well. All this that God is doing at St. Andrews means work for us, work for any who would be a part of this community. Discipline, responsibility, integrity, selflessness, these are the issues that God has taught us all these last decades, is teaching us now, this last interesting year, and I'm assured will teach us all as we go forward. We complain in our culture about the college graduates who cannot hold a job, cannot complete what they start, who struggle to tell the truth and live honest lives. Lewis acknowledged this problem a long time ago and linked it to their education and their formation. We make men without chests, he says, and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. Why are we surprised, says C.S. Lewis. The students at St. Andrews College are formed in the context of worship. The sensibilities of the liturgy inform their hearts and minds and bring them into the context of the rhythm of learning. We can say that we offer a Christian education all the day long. And I meet many Christian educators that talk like this, and I get it. Jesus informs their curricular choices, you know, everything. But until we bow the knee and embody that idea of Christian education in worship and prayer, we are just blowing in the winds of Gnosticism. We start each day with choral matins, and I tell the students often after that service that they have just done the most important thing they will do that day until evensong which ends the school day. And I think many of you know me, I'm not particularly slack or easy academically. At St. Andrews College, we have an intense traditional education framed in such a way that only the Anglican tradition can really well provide. The music and the education have been best set forth in the Anglican tradition. And unsurprisingly, it works. It has worked for century upon century. Being immersed in this ethos every day gives St. Andrew's College students an embodied sense of what a Christian thinks and does. St. Andrew's College is tight community. There's no getting around that. And by God's grace, it is transformative. The bookends of prayer and singing are also the glue that helps cement the education as a life change that frames the ethos of the student. God is doing amazing things at St. Andrews Lake Almanor, and we are looking for a few who have the courage, the temerity, and the tenacity to engage themselves in transformation and engagement with the culture. We invite you to a dangerous education to sail the waters which are marked on the map here be dragons. I've touched on many issues and I asked a lot of different people what they thought some of the issues were. Comments, questions, uh, you wanna pick an issue to jump into, let me know. Um, I'd be glad to have that discussion. I make a claim that Anglicanism is the best tradition, really. I mean, I think I almost said it that way. Only the Anglican tradition can well provide. Why do you think I say that? Do you think it's fair? You can go ahead and guess. It's okay to be wrong.
um, a lot of what we study and our history is bound up in the Anglican Church, coming from England and our culture is just from that, that area. And, and so I guess it would be important to <laughs> see how that influences it. To be fair, it's not the only influence in America by any stretch, by any long stretch. But um, we are an English speaking nation by and large and have been lots of other languages happening as well. Uh, our, our, our forebears who formed our government um, mostly were English colonists. And again, there's many, many others that are involved, but we have a very early start uh, in America uh, with the Anglican Church. Now, mind you, um, we could talk all day about the Puritans and how, uh, well, I, I'll try not to go there, but the Puritans um, have um, arguably as big or bigger an influence in American culture. Um, it's interesting, though, that, that uh, the one um, tradition that overwhelms every others in terms of presidents, which, you know, which tradition, church tradition were they a part of, is Anglicanism. I mean, that, that has been the, the largest group of presidents has, has come from the Anglican church. So yes, Emma, I think that's true. Um, I think if we go back and we look at Western culture, when you're an English speaking Western culture person, <laughs> um, your Western culture is shaped through in the English literature, English history. Um, it doesn't mean that's all there is. You can, you know, study German culture and be a German expert. Uh, but for most of American culture and, and um, arguments can be made in other directions, uh, the Anglican church is the one that has a lot of influence, even more than we think. So um, I'm sure most of you are aware that C.S. Lewis um, was an Anglican churchman. Um, did those of us that didn't grow up in Anglicanism, I didn't know that till I was in my 20s. I had no idea. Um, so there's just so many people out there that are influenced by this church and tradition who don't even know it, don't even realize it. Is that a fair statement, guys? I mean, please feel free to argue, like I said. So when you say that Anglicanism is the best tradition, and in in what way are you qualifying that? Are you specifically are you saying like you think everyone across the world should be Anglican, or or like the American context and the English experience? Anglicanism is the heritage that we come from. Well, I think the latter is definitely a point I was making. But I think the point about providing the best context um, or frame, if you will, um, really goes back to um, a long, long tradition of education in coming out of the English church. So the earliest um, recognizable education was um, at some level in the monasteries, and that's across Europe, uh, and then and then more particularly, um, somewhat linked to monasticism, but there were uh, cathedral schools, and those I'm really rusty on those numbers. I want to say those show up in the seven eight hundreds nine hundreds, um, and Oxford and Cambridge come directly out of a couple of those. Um, I think they date like formation a couple hundred years later. Um, but, you know, there was, there was foundation below that. And so we've just been doing education within the English church for a very, very long time. Who was, does anyone remember who the, um, uh, the influencer in Charlemagne's court and uh, someone who helped to bring about the Carolinian Renaissance? Do you remember who that was?
No one. How about St. Alcuin, the deacon from Northumbria, who um, Charlemagne said, hey, send me someone who can help me educate my kids. And they sent Alcuin. Um, <laughs> was the education always classical? Arguably, yes. Was it, always, was it always classical in the way that we see classical education today? Probably not. Um, there was a, 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 a slow but steady sifting, shifting, and movement. So the education that St. Augustine got as a pagan from pagan educators um, has been looked back at and rethought. Um, the education in the monastic world and the, and the cathedral schools was probably not quite as uh, classically um, engaged as what St. Augustine learned. Um, but by the time you get up into the Middle Ages and uh, the Renaissance, it's starting to look more like what we think of classical education. But my point is just that Anglicanism has a long history of that. Anglicanism um, provides a cultural context that is amazingly beneficial to this type of an education. Angli Anglicanism provides um, a moral foundation as well to this type of education, which um, I, 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 perhaps we should ask the question, if we're, not, if we're not discussing teaching coming to a rival at moral conclusions, what are we doing in education? Um, now that's not a very popular thing to say these days. But Christian education has always looked at the moral framework and the morals of and the mores and values of her students as important. Um, God has 10 commandments and those, though as simple as they are, they admit of much discussion, don't they? So do not bear false witness. So does that mean that we don't tell the... Um, uh, we don't tell the Nazis that we have Jews hiding in our basement, we'd be lying. So, you know, there's nothing quite as easy as we think. Um, Mr. Bergstrom, did I answer the question reasonably? Uh, yeah, I think generally, I, I, you know, I think there's one thing where you realize, it, at least in my thoughts and perspective and experience like how um there's a lot related to the question of like what is tradition and process versus um versus like a central gospel and and so that way in which like anglicanism being very benedictine in structure and having lots of influence from the ascetical, uh, mis uh, the ascetical and uh, was it the mystical skeptical synthesis. I know there's a different word, but it's like seeing the specific influences of Anglicanism and comparing that against, you know, orthodoxy uh, or, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholic, and asking the question of like, what is most beneficial. I think that's kind of the, the, the question to address. I think especially in a world where we exist right now, where those questions are probably the least pursued and that, you know, whatever is good for you is good for you. And mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the questions that a classical education is addressing really seem to be against, you know, everything that the world is asking, as you point out. So Kind of following up with that, you know, how do we make let me back people, let, or how let do we help back. people see the importance of it? Right. And and boy, that's a tough one. Let me let me back us up one question. I have a question for you. Um, without trying to be too terribly polemical, um, I want to hear some answers. Do you think, uh, particularly out of you young people, do you think that classical education? can be accomplished outside of a Catholic worldview. 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Um, because it, I would say because it has its origins in, uh, in a pagan worldview, right? Like the seven liberal arts mm -hmm. and the education that Augustine of Hippo, uh, well, I guess now that's being looked at again. Um, he but, received, yeah, he received a classical education. Yeah, he received a classical education and then you know, converted later. Um, so I've always thought of a classical education as, mm, yeah, uh, sort of intellectual. And then the church helps you develop your, you know, uh, moral convictions, right? But that's an argument. And, uh, anyone else? Anyone want to interact with uh, Mr. Turney's comments? What the ancients did was give all the, raise all the right questions, but they didn't have, uh, and they pointed in a direction, but they didn't give the, all the right answers. In other words, uh, they framed up the issues but they didn't actually have the substance. They knew it was in that direction. And so they're a wonderful on-ramp, but they are not in any meaningful way, the destination. They can get you started, but they can't get you there. And that's the difference. I would also, I would want to argue with you, Chris, uh, jumping in that Edu classical education has been contextualized since about 400, starting there in the church uh, to where within a couple hundred years, it almost didn't exist outside the church. So I think we have potentially, I'm going to argue with you, I think we have a definition problem. When we're talking classical education, we're really talking what the church has done for the last 1500 years, 1600 almost. So going back to the pagans and trying to repeat what they did, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's, I don't know, possible? Because the world's a different place, because we have more information. Now, in terms of can we argue, can we be pagans and read this literature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the big picture, um, classical education has been defined as Christian for 1500 years. So it's a new thing to jump back pre-Augustine, if you will, and um, pre-Christ at some level to, to that pagan world. It's an intriguing thing. Um, so it's an interesting, if you have an answer or, or, or a comment, please do. I'm saying it's an intriguing thing that you've brought up. It was actually outside what I was thinking about with my question. What I was thinking about was, um, I grew up Baptist. Is it possible to get a classical education in a Baptist worldview or a Baptist context no i don't think it is and i came to this conclusion probably 20 plus years ago um i right about the same time i think the seal was coming to the conclusion um and it's just that what the catholic worldview gives you is such a bigger, 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 bigger view of everything. It includes the earth, the cosmos, it includes everything. We're not slicing and dicing things up, which Protestantism has had a tendency to do. Uh, and Protestantism, Pro, don't hear me saying Protestantism is bad. I'm just saying, you know, there are bad things about Anglicanism, there are bad things about Baptists. There's, you know, we all have our warts. But one of the things that the present world does is divide things up and slice them. And basically it's, it's enlightenment oriented. And we've all suffered, every tradition. And now the Eastern Orthodox Church is suffering uh, in America because it's kind of finally come into modernity and the enlightenment and they don't like it very much. Um, but when they're being persecuted in the Middle East and in Russia, 
they kept their faith much more strongly because they, were, they didn't have the options that we have in the West. Um, so anyone want to argue with me? I, there's lots of Presbyterian schools out there that are classical. In fact, you know, Doug Wilson and his group up in Moscow, Idaho is kind of one of the main figures that uh, was around as part of this replanting of classical education. Um, and, and he and I have had tons of lovely arguments of just these sorts of things. Um, a Catholic world, well, go ahead. Oh, sorry, so sorry. What would you say in response to, and maybe I'm particularly calling out but it seems like it's someone you're calling out. Um, what would you say to the Baptist, fundamental Baptist family that is homeschooling using, you know, classical conversations as their, you know, material? Um, are you particularly saying like, that is not a classical education or is that, or that is not a fruitful classical education? Mm, might be a distinction without uh, meaning. Um, so first of all, every homeschool family's classical education looks different every time we turn around. So let's keep that in mind. Um, I think classical conversations is doing good stuff. I'm glad that people are in it. I think that um, they're raising the bar. Um, but because it is a multi-religious, if you will, you know, within Christianity um, group. It, it, it as an institution is not doing any shaping or forming in the way that an institution that is Catholic in its mindset will be about doing. Is that a fair, does that make sense? Um, so, if you're an Anglican child going to classical conversations and what you're learning in your texts are being reinforced with your parents and what you learn in your once a week class is being challenged or reinforced with by your parents. Basically, when you get into this type of a multi-denominational scene, the lowest common denominator wins. That's just how it works. So we are unapologetically Anglican. We're gonna say, you don't have to be even a Christian to go to school here, but you're going to get everything from this perspective. So we just wanna be open and honest with you upfront. This is who we are. This is how we deliver. Now, that being said, we can have a lot of conversation about what the Baptist believe about this or what a Calvinist believes or what a Lutheran or Roman, I mean, you know, and the discussion goes on. Um, so, and that's the beauty of it, a free flowing open discussion um, but I would say that um, there, there are plenty of, look, probably it's a, it's a sliding scale. We're not as good as we want to be. Um, we're better than we were. In some ways, we're probably worse than we were. Um, you know, it's always give and take, push and shove. When we started our fencing program at St. Andrew's Academy, our academics had to just back off an edge because these students were now fencing after school. They didn't have as much time to get that homework done. And so it was about a balance, but I thought, well, um, a full formed education is also physical and that's important to have. And if we you know, have to back our classes off from junior level college to sophomore level college, okay, well, we'll do it. Um, Other foods that Anglicanism uniquely allows you to draw in the best of the historic Christian traditions. In other words, uh, it allows you to draw from the uh, Orthodox, from the Catholic, from the Protestant, and from the uh, Greeks and Romans. In other words, in one sense, it is the prism that takes in all the light so that you actually have a multifaceted rainbow that actually is rooted deeply in the great tradition. So people talk about the great conversation. They talk about the great tradition. 
but then they educate it through a lens that only takes in one spectrum of the light and they will not engage with the patristics. They will not engage with the, uh, uh, the uh, Greek, ancient Greeks. They will not engage with Protestants. And what the Anglican uniquely does is allow you to actually filter all of those, that great tradition conversation into uh, a much larger and richer uh, educational experience and spiritual experience. It draws from the best of all of those traditions. Yeah, it's it, it, a lot of us uh, who preach for a living too um, have noted that, wow, if I was picked your other group, I wouldn't be able to quote so-and-so. I wouldn't be able to, I mean, I quote widely. I'm not a Calvinist, but I quote John Calvin periodically. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that same idea that uh, we're drawing from many, many different places um, in our spirituality. Well, it, it, we have a rooted spirituality, but it is open to what the world's doing and interacting with. It's not, hey, take, I'm, we're taking our toys and going home. It's engaging uh, in the best. Now, there are many Anglicans who are not that. And sometimes I cringe, but... Um, because, and those are people who've been influenced by the Enlightenment generally and they end up with a kind of Protestantized Anglicanism. And well, so what classical Anglicanism means or Orthodox Anglicanism allows you to be, and it's the reason I have stayed Anglican is that in fact, I can draw and have conversations meaningfully with all the great traditions in the richness that they all bring into the conversation without having to think I've got it all figured out. I can draw from the richness of the whole conversation, not just a fraction of it. Yeah, no, I think that's, that is something that plays right into the educational life and the academic life. And obviously we read widely from many traditions, uh, including pagan. I, I, I could regale you with stories in my early years of teaching in a fundamentalist school where they wanted to lynch me for teaching Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Um, I think there was even a picture on the front of the book of a Greek vase that actually had uh, a naked person on it. So obviously I was going straight to hell. Um, so uh, the, yep. That was not a question. Um, the being framed in prayer is much more important than you might think. Um, the prayer life of the college is going to influence and affect the academic life. It's going to influence and affect the relationships. And remember that unless you're going to do all of your college just like this, which I refuse, <laughs> <laughs> to do. Uh, this, is, this is a means for people to get an idea of what it might be like to be here. And um, then to be here means that you're going to be part of a community of scholars, bigger, smaller, whatever. Uh, it can't get too big or the, the, the benefits get lost. But to be a part of a community means that you're relating. And relating means that two humans who are not Jesus are going to offend one another, rub one another the wrong way. So one of the things that is most necessary in an academic scholarly school environment is an ability to reconcile, to ask forgiveness, to extend God's grace in relationships, in scholarly relationships, because that's what's here. I had one student who uh, just, was always at her best when she was in a community. Not just one or two would suffice, but a small community of learners who were, they're learning together. And, and that's me. I mean, people get tired of me asking questions. They'll, I'll say, well, what about yeah, you, you know, A, B, and C? I don't do this quite as much anymore because I've matured a little bit. Um, and they'll say, oh, it's this, that, and the other. And I'll say, no, 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 that can't work like that. Well, why did you ask me? Oh, well, because I wanted to learn. <laughs> this is how I learn. 
And a lot of people get really tired of that. Um, but that's, uh, that is generally the way of learning is discussion, dialogue, uh, debate sometimes, making a good argument. And that's kind of the beauty of humanities studies is getting to be a part of that. And that is so, is so important to foundation that discussion, to build the foundation in prayer and to conclude in prayer every day. And so it gives a spiritual ethos to a school, unlike any other school. I mean, uh, Anglican schools that pray the office are unlike any other institutions I've ever been a part of or visited or seen. The liturgy is a teacher, there's pedagogy and liturgy. Um, the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness while we work, study, and pray is so easily the fruition of an Anglican college context. It's just as it, 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 it's what naturally comes to the surface. Yes, so does our sin. And sometimes we make life ugly for us and for others, but all things being equal, if we're moving forward, we are practicing, we're participating, we're singing, we're discussing, and we're working, studying, and praying our motto in Latin, of course, and pursuing truth, goody, goody truth, beauty, and goodness. Um, and that's what most naturally comes out of this context. And I think it's a beautiful way to learn. Um, I would think that if you were to ask Emma, who graduated from the academy, she would tell you it's not always easy. It's not always easy relationally. It's not always easy in the community. Uh, it's not always easy to figure out what you think about this text when someone else is arguing the exact opposite and but that's that's the beauty of it is you know let's get a little bit of this going on while still maintaining some unity and community spiritually emotionally relationally anything that i haven't um at least touched on guys that that you're intrigued by Let's, um, go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe one small slash big thing. Um, I don't know. I'll, it's uh, too complicated of too long and too complicated of an issue to give a a good summary, at least for me. But I've been thinking about your question of why there aren't many good uh, Anglican colleges in America. Uh, when I go uh, to an Anglican church, uh, an Orthodox Anglican church, um, it's, uh, you know, maybe 50 to 90% uh, old people. <laughs> uh, when I go to a Roman Catholic church, it's like 80%, you know, uh, kids. Uh, there's more kids than adults. Um, so is there, a connect is there a connection there? You know, um, where it's like, uh, I I know I know we're at the end here, um, but I just time. but think that that's like an important factor. Uh, it's just you know, I, I, I think that um, you're used to a church. Your home church has a lot more young people than most of the traditional churches you've been to, probably Anglican churches. So there are some churches out there with young people. What I have seen, this is anecdotal, not statistical. I've been a priest for 20 years. I've been an Anglican for 30, 1992. Is that 30 years? That's 30 years. Um, unfortunately, that makes me old. Um, when, when I first showed up, there weren't you know, wherever I would go, there weren't young people. Um, there were a few, and like my priest had kids that were in the parish. Um, and as we've gone forward, I've noted that the churches are getting younger and younger. Um, I've never had that problem here, St. Andrews. 
I would say for the majority of the 20 years and even beyond that, that I've been in charge of a parentship here, um, we were outnumbered two to one often, under 18 to over 18. Um, I had a hard time for years getting older people in my church. I now feel like I'm much more balanced. I have little little tykes. I have, you know, 20-something families. Um, I'm a little slim on the 30-somethings at the moment. And then I've got some older folks as well. Um, you know, all the way up to um, my uh, former assistant priest's widow came to church Sunday. I think she's 93. Um, so it's lovely to see that span. Back to your question, though, um, is that, yeah, that's probably part of it. I think the other part of it is that the, um, the church in America doesn't seem to be interested in raising up the next generation, the Anglican church. Um, we could say, honestly, I could probably make the same argument, and many Roman Catholics would make the same argument for their parochial schools. They're there. There's lots of them, although hundreds shut down in 2008 and 2009. But there's a lot of parochial schools still left, but oftentimes they're, what they're doing is just mimicking public school progressive education. Um, I have had some chats with some of the muckety mucks of the ACNA, and a couple have just said, this is, we really need to get behind educating our kids. I would say that it's the traditional, um, the traditional parishes that are going to end up doing it. Uh, all the churches in the Anglican School Association, excuse me, all the schools in the Anglican School Association have all seen growth in the church from their school. They've all seen young families coming in. So this type of uh, primary grammar school and secondary schooling is really useful for growing the church. When you get to the college scene, well, we now have kids that are graduating some of our Anglican School Association schools. Where are they going to go to school? What's the options? We have homeschoolers all over the Anglican world. There's not many options for college that is not a little bit crazy and really expensive. So um, by the way, there's another micro college. I just heard about it yesterday morning. Uh, so I think we're close to 15, Dr. Seal, aren't we? Um, 13. Well, adding this one. St. Joseph the Worker College. Um, smart, thoughtful, creative, imaginative. Um, so this is a whole thing going on. Um, and I'm glad that we're, we've got a representative of Anglicanism in this world of small micro colleges. Um, and yes, it's time to raise up the next generation, give them a foundation that is solid, that can be built upon, that their kids can build upon, and that generations can build upon. But to do that, we need to do kind of what we we're talking about tonight. Uh, otherwise, we're just part of the mayhem and the chaos of our current culture. Here's a question for you. This, this swirls around, you know, you have to be Catholic, uh, Dr. Sue would argue, so would I, uh, to have real classical education in the way that we've understood it for the last 1500 years, or at least the last 500, say. Um, so what would qualify? I, I don't think that we'll come up with a list that, you know, will be the list. I'm just wondering, like, what would qualify to, to put you into that camp? Would Anglicanism? Obviously, I think so. Roman Catholicism? It's got that whole Catholic thing going. What about Lutheranism? I think that lots of Lutherans are very Catholic minded. And I think we can have some Lutheran schools doing some really good classical education. I don't know enough to say further than that. Um, I'm not a Lutheran scholar or a Luther scholar for that matter. What other traditions are out there that could possibly support classical education in this way orthodox yeah the problem, I, the problem with orthodox is that they have a tendency to be so ethnocentric that uh, 
I always tell people, you know, you might want to become Orthodox, but the problem is you have to immigrate before you convert. And so they have such a strong national flavor to them that they, they tend to be ethnocentric. And, uh, and you get all of Orthodoxy with a kind of openness through Orthodox Anglicanism. In fact, the Celtic tradition of which uh, Orthodox Anglicanism is the fullest expression uh, of what's remaining of that uh, was heavily indebted to the uh, Desert Fathers and the, the greats of the Orthodox tradition. Uh, all of their monuments had Orthodox saints on them. And so uh, there's a, a huge overlap. The other thing to say is the vibrancy of Anglicanism is in Africa today and it's all young and it's in southeast asia and southeast asia in other words, it's all, it's all young people driving it. the um the other thing that um confuzzles me um and i've met a number of very good orthodox classical educators and i've visited more than one school uh but it does puzzle me at some point that um, the tradition of orthodoxy, which never changes, just ask them, um, is teaching a corpus that is largely Western. And I, I find it, I chuckle at it. Um, now, I don't know if most of the orthodox schools ever teach Latin, but it might be argued that you can't truly be classically educated if you haven't studied Latin, at least some. Um, and so obviously orthodoxy has the Greek history as, as you know, in her backyard or in her front yard, depending on where you're at. Um, but it, it's, it's an interesting, I, I find it rather positive because um, the orthodox classical educators actually have to, have to come onto my turf a little bit to have a discussion and that they don't tend to do that very often you know not theologically for sure um so i have known quite a few wonderful classical orthodox educators um in various contexts and i'm glad to have them in the game and i'm hoping that that type of a um playing field will help help us to engage um at other levels as well in other words, if we can come together to educate, maybe we can come together to worship God. Maybe we could someday all sit at the same table. Wouldn't that be awesome? So anyways, that's, um, unless you have a question or a comment, um, there be dragons. This is dangerous stuff in this world. This is being brave. This is saying, yeah, I'm gonna take this plunge. Um, I want to see a cohort form. Pray about it. Pray if you're cold, be at St. Andrews this fall, even perhaps. All right, we're going to sign off a little bit early. Look, five minutes earlier than we have been, at least. Um, next week, same time, same day, we have visiting professor um, Roberta Bear from Patrick Henry College. Um, she, if I'm not mistaken, I think she teaches medieval political philosophy using Dante. Um, this lady is a blast. Uh, I said, you can't do Dante. We don't have time for Dante. <laughs> so she's going to tackle uh, the second chapter of Lewis's um, The Weight of Glory. No, the, the oh my gosh, now I'm confused. The evolution of man, I think. Just look for it. It'll be posted up here soon. Um, and by the way, did you enjoy the um, the graphic for this for this week? Yeah. I thought it was. I really liked it. So thank you, Mr. Morgan, for all of his hard work. Uh, he also is. He came up with all of them. So I, I think I got the best graphics for my two talks. <laughs> all right. Again, 
uh, St. Andrews College, Summer Dialogues and Discussions. See you next week. God bless.